want to be successful? Well, that's an unfair question. It, of course, it depends upon the definition of success. I've known a lot of people who met the world's definition of success and end up being some of the most miserable people in the world. But do you really want to be successful at a revitalization where it counts, which is in God's eyes and the, the eyes of the gospel? Mark Clifton and I have been talking about this issue for two episodes, and the entire three-part episode has been called Defining Success in a Church Revitalization. We've gone through three parts. No, we've gone through two parts. This will be part three. We talked, first of all, about the four myths of revitalization, and we could review those, but we'd rather you go back and listen to episode number two, 52, and not only listen to it, but get your friends and then listen to it maybe 15 or 16 times, and then you'll, you'll, you'll thoroughly have it down. Then episode number 253, which was part two of this, is why numerical growth is not always the best indicator of success. Let me tell you, this is the this is the clarion call that you've been hearing from Mark Clifton for years. And you, you need to go back and listen to some of those nuggets. Even better, watch it on YouTube because listening to Mark alone is just not the joy of seeing him also on YouTube. So go back, go back and listen and view that. Defining success, why numerical growth is not always the best success. So are the best measured success. Today, Episode 264, we're defining success in church revitalization with this topic, revitalization successes that cannot be measured. And this is where some of the frustration comes in. Some of the, some of the, okay, am I really a success? Because some of this has so much intrinsic value, it does not have quantitative measurements, and therefore we don't see, in a quantitative sense of the word, those successes that are taking place. Mark. Before we went live, you were talking about the number of bivocational pastors that you mentor, you assist, you resource, you listen to. And I have to believe that this is one of the things on their mind. Yeah, it really is, because they feel very much like they're always going to be judged by how many people show up on Sunday. And we, like we've said so many times, 20, 30 percent are not coming back after COVID. We're also up against cultural headwinds that we've never been up against before. Ooh, I like that being closer so, to the mic, Mark. We're, we're hearing you. Good. Yes, let me. <laughs> we're, here, we're really hearing you now. That's good. I think I, sh- I think I should just tape myself to this <laughs> thing. I, I have a hard time standing still. So let me, let me say it again for those of you like me who can't hear. Uh, yes, so many times bivocational pastors feel like they are really valued by how many people show up on Sunday morning. Or any, any pastor does, but particularly that group, I suppose, of normative-sized churches. And as we said before, 20 to 30 percent are not coming back after COVID. Mm-hmm. Churches are facing stronger cultural headwinds than we ever imagined or that we really ever were prepared for. Okay. And so all of those things have, have combined to create a weightiness on pastors that they feel like they're failing. And when you feel like you're failing, it's just hard to, to put your put your shoulder into the work and stay with it because you feel like and you question whether you should even be doing this or not or whether you should be somewhere else. I hear that all the time. And most of it, Dr. Rayner, is based on the fact that they are looking at numerical growth as the primary indicator of their success. We mentioned this in a previous and, uh, episode, Mark. Back in my and your day, and even so a good bit today, you didn't greet pastor to pastor with how are you doing? You greeted one another with what are you running? And that 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 yeah. that, that became the label by which your success was measured. And I think some of that came from the fact that uh, back in the day, as you and I like to say, that's our favorite phrase in this. <laughs> You should just you rename the podcast. Back in the day, Mark, you remember those days? <laughs> Here we go. Here yeah. we go. Oh yeah, yeah. It is. You should. You should. We should just. Yeah, we should just uh, we should just rename the podcast back in the day. Yeah, for those for those of you uh, who are about the watching this, that I'm Mark used to. has an ori- yeah. the original model telephone. Do with the candlestick phone, like they used on Andy yeah. Griffith. So and, uh, that's what uh, I got. Just just for an aside, anyway. do you remember the operator's name on Andy Griffith? I don't, I don't oh, I should. Uh, give me a second. Um, I'm sorry. I, oh, I uh, Sarah, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Sarah, Sarah right? Can, can, it was Sarah. Sarah. I'm calling for B. Is, is, is she getting her hair done? I need to speak to her there. 
By the way, I, I saw something on Facebook the other day. That the reason the reason Mayberry was such a happy place is that nobody was married. <laughs> Barney wasn't married. Aunt B wasn't married. Andy wasn't married. Floyd wasn't. Uh, I mean, uh, Floyd was married, but Goober wasn't married. Goober wasn't married. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Never mind. We're, oh, we should call this a podcast back in the day because back in the yeah. day, state papers were read by every pastor. I mean, and every leader because we didn't have the Internet. And it was and state papers back in the day would come out, I think, every week. Many of them did, certainly a couple times a month. And they would list, at least where I grew up in Missouri, they in the middle they every month, they would have a, a listing of every church in the state convention and their Sunday school attendance for that month. And churches would send in their Sunday school attendance. And it was an amazing place to open that up and compare yourself to everybody else yes. and see who the biggest church was in your association, the biggest church. And I think that's kind of where that competitive nature, because you could look at it on one page and see what everybody was, quote, running. And I think that I remember my dad always going to that and looking at it. And I remember me as a kid looking at it and seeing there were like three or four churches, Southern Baptist churches in our town, yeah. right? And a couple of us were kind of equal all the time. And I remember even as a kid, like 10 years old, hoping we would we would beat the other church. I mean, how how how, did, how weird is that? But, I mean, that's the way we were thinking. And I think some of that just got into our, our DNA. I, I think probably in the 1800s, they didn't ask how many are you running. I don't think that was as big an issue. They probably asked how many of you converted, how many maybe you baptized mm-hmm. or something like that, but how many you had on Sunday morning. Because back in those days— how many you had basically was dependent on how many people lived within five miles of your yep. church. You couldn't do much about it. Many that. of them walked. Right. So it's all it's it's been very different. And uh, Martin Lloyd Jones, I read a quote from him the other day. He said, um, "The New Testament is not concerned with numerical growth, but with doctrinal purity uh, in the New Testament church." As you read Paul's letters to Timothy, and uh, there's certainly some truth in that. Well, let's talk about some of these things that cannot be precisely measured. Now you can measure how many, what you're running to use that number. You can measure number of conversions or baptisms or professions of faith, depending upon your background. I know those are three categories in different churches, different denominations. But how do you measure people and how they're growing as a disciple? You can have some surrogate measures, like how many people are in Bible study, how many people show up for a corporate prayer time. But when it comes down to it, you cannot really precisely measure how many people are growing as disciples. Well, and I think, too, Dr. Rayner, when we think about eternity and uh, being with our Lord for eternity, and, and we, when we, we enter the heaven and everybody wants to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I remember Henry Blackaby used to say, everybody quotes that, but you're not going to hear it unless you've actually done well. So. <laughs> Well, you missed it, Tom. Would you step aside? There's someone beside you. I want to talk. It's like it was like you know that's not just given to everybody, you know. But nonetheless, uh, I digress. But you know, I, I, when we get to heaven, I, I think it's not going to matter as much that that particular month we broke the 200 barrier. I think what's going to matter is how do we make some disciples that made disciples. I mean, I, I think the real longevity of our ministry, probably the real fruit of our ministry isn't necessarily the number of people who show up on any given month or any given year or the average attendance that we have. Um, it, and I know that from just being an old man and being around a long time. I mean, numbers in churches grow and shrink, and churches have sp- periods of incredible numerical growth for a variety of reasons. Some of it's demographic and other things. Then they have periods of decline. But going on through all of that, hopefully, are some men and women who are becoming true disciples of Jesus, and it's having an eternal effect on the kingdom, and only heaven's going to reveal that. So while numerical growth is an easier way to count our success, I don't think it has much to do with eternity. I think the true eternal way of counting our success is doing what Jesus asked us to do, which was to make disciples. And it cannot be precisely measured. And some of you out there are, you are a bivocational pastor. You have a full-time job. Uh, in the marketplace, you have a full-time job and part-time pay in uh, your church, and yet you're still mentoring someone. You're still preaching faithfully. You're still working your small groups together. 
That's where disciples are being made. And those are the ones that we need to give the accolades to and the glory to God in the process. And that's what we're saying here. Number two. But there are ways, Dr. Rayner, there are ways to truly quantify in some ways or at least evaluate discipleship, right? Well, I think I, I think the answer is yes, and then I'm supposed to say, and what are they, Mark? <laughs> You're supposed to take a little longer than that because I'm trying to look something oh, okay. up. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I will I will say this while you're trying to look something up. One good measure of discipleship, not the measure, is those involved in Bible study. Because if you got people involved in Bible That's study, true. they're growing as disciples. That's why the Sunday school attendance number in the old days, that's why that number had more importance to me than maybe even a worship attendance number, because I knew that they were there studying the word. That's true. Have you had time now? Stretch it out any longer? That's great. How many how many people are reading their Bible on a regular basis and, and, and growing that way? But the other way you can determine that, even as a pastor, I you know we have about forty to sixty on Sunday morning at Linwood. And I meet on a regular basis. Uh, that means at least twice a month with a couple of, of men in that church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't do nearly as good a job on discipling them as I should. Um, I'm constantly aware of that. I ought to be spending more of my time doing that. The adversary finds all kinds of reasons to fill up my time with other things. But um, just the other day, well, I'll just be very honest. I, my, I, we got a new house here in, in the, near Linwood Baser where we live. And uh, big rainstorms last couple of nights, and my sump pump failed in the middle of the night. Ooh. It's a new sump pump, so I come down here and I start bailing out water, not out of the basement, but out of the sump pump pit. So about four in the morning, I text a couple of my <laughs> guys at church, and I say, "Look, when you get up, uh, give me a call. I, I got a, I got a problem here." So sure enough, this one young man that I'm I'm discipling, uh, he's about the age of my son. He's about late thirties, and uh, he he came over with his little boy, his uh, nine ten year old boy, and um, and uh, um, they fixed my sump pump. We replaced it. Wow. But I've been meeting with him, and he's been asking me, you know, how can I be a better dad? How can I, how can I raise my children? And I said, you know, I, I really believe there's, there's some cool things about uh, catechisms for kids. That's something you can go through with your kids. You read the Bible every night, which he does. Pray with him every night, which he does. But I said, I really think there's something to be said for, for some catechism for, for kids. So we were walking upstairs from the basement, and he turned to his son. He, he asked him, he said, hey. He said, what's our only hope in life and death? And this little eight, nine-year-old boy just said with such confidence that we are not our own, but that we belong to God. Oh, and I thought, you know, I mean, here's this dad discipling his son because I'm discipling the dad, right? You can measure that. I mean, what's going to be the benefit of that little kid long after I'm gone to heaven? Who knows what's going to happen because of that kind of thing? And I, I just think we, we downplay so much those major parts we can have in people's lives by saying, well, we only had 40 there Sunday morning. We were down by 10. Well, okay. But what about the ones we had? And I, I can't tell you, I had a really tough week. I've had a really tough month. But just hearing that little kid repeat that first line, and he says, we go through these every night, and how that's just being implanted in his heart by his dad was just a really amazing moment for me that I really needed. And the Lord really blessed me from it, and, and still does, even to this moment. So you can, you can, in a way, evaluate discipleship in ways like that, but it's not as simple as saying how many showed up exactly. on Exactly. You also cannot measure. You can see it. You can know it. But you can't always have a numerical measure for community involvement and impact. And a lot of churches are making a great difference in the community. But there's nothing to report it on. Um, you know, you, you don't have an envelope system for that. You don't have an ACP or some type of denominational reporting system. You know, but the community is being changed because the church and the church members are present there. And we just want to make the community noticeably better because the people who love Jesus and follow Jesus are living here. As I say all the time, the most generous people in the neighborhood should be the church. It should be Christians because we've been dealt more generously with than anybody else. We've been given eternal life, not based on us, but based on Christ. And so out of that generosity that we've been given, we should be the most generous people with our building with our money, with our time, with our heart. And we're not generous in order to get people to come on Sunday morning. That's not, you don't, 
You don't serve the community to get the community inside your building. You serve the community to get the people in your building into the lives of the community. And no, you're, it's like, it's like discipleship. You're, you're not going to always see the full results of it, but trust me, good things are happening. Uh, this little town we serve in Linwood, 400 people. We've had free garage sales. We've, we've stood in line and gave out Chick-fil-A sandwiches to the parents, you know, when they drive up to drop their kids off for school across the street from us. We've had two or three large community concerts. We've had cleanup days for the community. We've helped build some sidewalks for the community. I mean, on and on and on. And it's like, well, how many people are from the community are, are coming? Well, there's a few, but I had uh, last Sunday, I had some people visit, uh, actually, my sister from St. Louis. And when she got home to St. Louis, she said, hey, we've got some friends who live in Linwood. And we had no idea. That's a little town. So she said, I told them we were at church this morning. And she texted me and she said, our friends who live in Linwood, now they've never been to our church. She said, oh, man, everybody in town <laughs> loves your church and loves what's going on. I love there. it. I mean, you just don't know the impact you're truly having. Even if they don't show up at the free garage sale, they know you're giving stuff away. Even if they don't show up and, and get the free sandwich on some, on, during the, when you're dropping kids off at school, the rest of the community knows you're doing that. And you're not, you know, in our case, we're not doing it once a year on one Sunday a year. We do some, try to do something every month and even more than that. And, yeah, you, you, you judge it by, by the sense that you, you get the awareness that, that, that the whole spiritual climate of the community is beginning to change, that people's opinion about the church are beginning to change. Not about the fact that, well, we did this block party and the next Sunday we had five new people show up. That's not the reason to do a block party. <laughs> Well said, Mark. Well said. Um, this I'm, I'm not referring to a small church here. It's a it's a larger church. It's Lakeview Baptist Church in Auburn, Alabama. Al Jackson was pastor there for many, many years. Um, it, again, it was a large church in a college town. I think there's a college there. I'm not sure if I can remember the name of the college in Auburn, but. The, the thing that I remembered about Lakeview and when Al Jackson was minister there and the pastor, they still may be doing it, was they counted how many people they sent, particularly to the international mission field, but also North American church planting. They counted how many people they sent as a part of their mission. And it's not like they kept a number on a billboard in front of you to say, look at us, but that's where they kept themselves accountable. Well, but you really cannot measure the impact to people you have sent after you have sent them. You can do some. Isn't that yes. true? Absolutely. And just like I said, you can't really measure the impact of, of mentoring and discipling a dad who then mentors and disciples his son. I mean, what's that going to be like in 50 years if the Lord doesn't return? And, and pastors, that's where you invest your time is in people. That's what Jesus did. You know, Jesus never leveraged his, his ability to draw a crowd in Galilee. He never leveraged that for his own purposes. He, he, he would always get away from the crowd and spend more detailed time with, with the few. And so I think we can learn from that. Sometimes we think it's all about the end day, just getting a big crowd, and that gives us power and influence. But your real power and influence comes when you're one-on-one -on -one with one person and you're spending time with them. That's when it really happens. If I am not mistaken, Mark Clifton, most of the Sundays when you are at Linwood, there's a lot of joy in the in the room. Am I wrong or am I yeah. right? You're right. I mean, it's the one hour and a half every week I, I just look forward to. I can't wait to be there. There's a lot of you're right. We're just it's just happy. If you showed up at Linwood, that's what my sister said, you know, Sunday. She kept saying, such a happy place. Everybody was in such good spirits. And look, it's it's not a happy time in our world. In fact, when we preached last Sunday morning, as you're listening to this, we're just a, a couple of weeks away from the tragedy in Texas, and we referenced that. And it was also it was Memorial Day, and so we referenced the loss of our loved ones and but our grief is informed by the hope of the gospel, and, and being together helps us share that, that grief and, and carry each other's burdens. And just the eagerness to be together in community is a joyful time, even in painful times. And, and you don't have to have 500 to do that. You can do that with 30. And that, that's, that's what's so exciting. And that's the one thing people notice when they come to our church. Well, we don't have anybody that can play a musical instrument, all right? Not a single person. Really? 
we, we use taped music and and a bunch of other stuff like that. But but it doesn't really matter because we're happy to be there. We're happy to be with each other. Well, I just wanted you to notice what I notice, and that is every time you start talking about Linwood Baptist Church, you are joyous. You are recalling the joy <laughs> that is there. So I don't always get a smile with Mark Clifton. You know, mention Jill, smile. Mention Linwood, smile. Mention grandchildren, smile. Mention your boys, smile. But uh, uh, th- those are the consistent ones that are there. So joy is just one of those things that a lot of revitalizations don't have. And I can hear a pastor saying, well, you ought to see the grumpy people in my church and the malcontents. Well, I assure them of this. There are some joyous people there. And if you focus on them, right. the whole church is going to be greater in joy. Absolutely. Totally. And when I first went to Warnell Road in Kansas City, bless those saints' heart, most of them were all grumpy. I mean, they, <laughs> but they'd been through a yes. lot. They'd been wounded, and and it was a hard time for them. And it took a while for them to come around. But after four or five years, they become some of the sweetest, happiest people I'd ever known. They didn't turn around overnight, but even your grumpy people, if they're truly regenerate, the gospel will make them happy again. And 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 the way you deal with them and the way you way they get to see Jesus work in the lives of other people can make them happy again. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be doing this work. And that is a good way to amen all of this. Hey, before I go, let me say this. I just got my hairs cut, and the person who cuts my hairs is named Kristen. Uh, I, I will stay with someone for a period, usually through conversion and then some some level of discipleship, presuming that they do become followers of Christ. She asked me what I was doing today. I said I was going to record a podcast, and she's been listening to another podcast I did. I said, I want you to listen to the one, and I'm going to give her the date. I haven't given it to her yet. I'll text it. And I said, I'm going to do a shout-out to Kristen and just say, Jesus is getting closer, Kristen. You're about there. <laughs> so, I love so it. Kristen, I love you, it. Just, you heard the shout-out that I promised you. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, viewers. And I hope you're a lot of viewers watching on YouTube because – there's not much, many things lovelier than a joyous Mark Clifton. I mean, it just it just makes my heart jump for joy. And as always, thank you for being a part of Revitalize and Replant. We will work together for God's glory to make churches get healthier. Mm-hmm.